Uh, this session is a continuation of the interview with Ralph Wagner Ward, a highly decorated veteran of the European theater of World War II. The first interview took place on July 19, 2007. Today is July 30, 2007, and we are in the WILL television studio in Campbell Hall at the University of Illinois in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Harriet Williamson. I am a producer with WILL Radio. Also in the studio is Mr. Ward's wife, Wilma Lee Broughton Ward, and Julius Bolton, who's director of lighting, sound, and camera. Uh, in the last two sessions on July 19th, Mr. Woolard told us about his background, how he became a soldier in the U.S. Army, his training, his transport to Africa, and descriptions of several major battles, uh, for example, Monte Cassino and Anzio. At the end of the last session, Mr. Woolard had taken us through Rome to the town of Megliano, where he was in another battle and subsequently suffered multi wounds, followed by surgery in Naples with a four week recovery period and sent to a reconditioning camp. Um, does this take us through uh, July 1944? Am I correct in the date or do I have to? June 14th was the date of the injury. Okay. And then uh, I joined the, uh, my outfit in August, toward the end of August. Okay. Uh, Mr. Woolard, could you please identify your rank in uh, Army Company and Unit and uh, continue your story? Yes, I, <clears throat> my rank at the end of the war and for a couple of months bef before the end was Staff Sergeant. I eventually became a, a squad leader of the uh, intelligence squad. Uh, prior to that, uh, all through the Italian campaign, I had the rank of corporal, which is really an assistant to the squad squad leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I was in Naples uh, at a hospital, which was really a tent hospital, and uh, had, I thought, very good care from uh, nurses, doctors, the entire staff, and um, a friend of mine who had been wounded at the same time I was wounded, his name was Waylon P. Dulles, he lives in, he was one of the original members of the 36th Division, a uh, very slightly built fellow with uh, some college behind him and a tremendous sense of humor, but uh, he liked Bino pretty well. Um, he was wounded in the knee, and uh, he was sent back to his outfit, to our outfit, before I was. But uh, in a march that they had to make, <clears throat> his knee uh, got to swelling again, and it was about the size of a large grapefruit. And uh, the unit sent him back to the hospital. <clears throat> there were several hospitals in the general area where uh, I was located, and he was to go to another hospital, but everyone had to fun funnel themselves through a admissions officer and then off to a, whatever hospital they were to get the best treatment in. Uh, Dawes uh, failed to go to the admissions unit. He had been drinking a bit of vino, and uh, he was a happy-go-lucky fellow. He, his intent was to look me up, and which he did. He found me, and, and uh, I was not supposed to get out of bed by doctor's orders. But uh, I knew that Dawes should be over at the admission office. I uh, said, Dawes, come with me. We'll go over. I got some crutches and took him over there. The... Uh, he was happy all the way. And we met the admissions officer. Uh, the admissions officer had s said, roll up your pant leg. He did so. Of course, it was a huge knee. And the admission officer says, soldier, just what is it you can't do with that knee? <laughs> Dawes looked at him for some time and he said, sir, I can't play the piano with it. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't 
set very well with the admissions officer, but nevertheless, Dawes got in and he uh, had an entry that never allowed him to come back to the 36th Infantry Division, which I was in all through the war. I think uh, toward the end of August, uh, they said that uh, I should go to a re reconditioning camp, which was uh, 10 or 15 miles north of Naples. It was a small village just on the uh, coastline of the Mediterranean. I, uh, we took uh, daily swims in the Mediterranean. We walked uh, or hiked around a mountain and uh, d did some running uh, for almost a week. The uh, interesting thing about that location was that it was called Lake Averno. It was an old volcano. The mountain itself was a uh, volcano at one time, but had been filled in with water, mm -hmm. a beautiful place. It, and, and the Virgil's Iliad, it was the entrance to hell. And the, uh, as the story goes. And uh, sometime I'd like to go back, but uh, haven't made so yet. Uh, at the end of that period, the reconditioning camp, uh, I was to rejoin my outfit. Now the uh, 36th Division had been pulled off the Italian front and was uh, now uh, in France. They had uh, led the invasion to southern France and uh, up the Rhone Valley, and I was to join them in southern France. The division had, or in uh, wherever they were when I could catch up with them, the uh, division had uh, a rather easy time of it, comparatively speaking, in going into southern France. It was nothing like Normandy and northern France, but uh, there were uh, men who were lost, I think the most serious wound that anyone in my squad uh, had was a little, a little finger which was, bent, which was uh, cut and uh, was crooked for the rest of his life. But uh, uh, the uh, fighting uh, at the, uh, once a bridgehead had been uh, developed, a beachhead had been developed, then the Germans uh, retreated uh, uh, very rapidly. They knew that they couldn't fight on so many fronts. They had to pull their lines together. Matters of supply were critical. And uh, so uh, the German troops uh, vacated much of southern France up through the Rhone Valley, and we in pursuit of them. Um, every once in a while, they would stop and uh, fight a delaying action. And uh, it took a couple of weeks for us to get up to a point where they really were determined to make a stand. It, uh, in, in that time, uh, we had a, a few days off, uh, maybe from the line. We'd, they'd pull us out for a couple of days and uh, then we'd go back in. Uh, it was not, at that particular time, it was not quite as intense as the fighting in, in Italy. But um, there are some scenarios that uh, might be of interest here. Um, the, every once in a while, you see some things that uh, you won't see in any place other than in actual warfare. For instance, uh, we were at we attacked one village, French village, and uh, we the Germans were moved out, and I was rummaging around in a house. Uh, <clears throat> 
what I was really trying to find was some chicory. Now, I knew that the French were using chicory rather than coffee. They couldn't get it. And we were out of coffee, and I was trying to find in this house some chicory, which I didn't find. But I, all of a sudden, I heard uh, a lot of commotion. I looked out the window, and here a group of Frenchmen. I'm assuming that they were members of the French forces of the interior, which was a, a small group of uh, French patriots who uh, occasionally or uh, act to disrupt German movements. They would sabotage a train or um, shoot up some Germans, which they thought they could. But looking across the street, this was into a kind of a municipal building and there was a public square. There were 18 or 19 uh, Frenchmen and one girl. She uh, was a woman of about 19, uh, 20 years, I should say. And uh, I called uh, my um, one of the squad members who spoke French, and I said, what are they doing over here? And they're yelling, and, and he said, uh, well, they're accusing her of fraternizing with the Germans. She had a German boyfriend. And they took out some scissors and some shears, mm -hmm. and they cut off all of her hair, and uh, then told her that she was to leave the community. That pointed in the direction, and uh, they, they got down to the bare skin and the uh, and her hair. This was not uh, the same every place. It was duplicated in a lot of different towns, and sometimes it was more, uh, they would strip the, uh, strip the woman of all of her clothing, shave her hair, and uh, send them out of town. Uh, so that was the first time you had seen that? Uh, that uh, was in uh, northeastern France, mm -hmm. and uh, that was, it it set, it uh, it bothered me, frankly. I thought uh, to myself, I that you fellows probably uh, never did too much to oppose the Germans, in in my estimation, they occasionally would get something done, but uh, here they were picking on this woman, but. There are things like that you can't control. We well, that was out of our jurisdiction, and uh, we had to move on. At another point, I think I might have told you uh, there were two fellows in my squad who could speak German. One, well, a young man from Chicago, whose parents had been killed in a German concentration camp. He was uh, uh, gotten out of Europe, out of Germany, by an uncle who lived in Chicago who was able to manage some way of getting him uh, back, uh, or getting him to Chicago at the age of 14. Uh, <clears throat> he was a very bright fellow, a Jewish fellow. And uh, he uh, had an intense feeling about the germ Germans. And you can understand it. We, of course, part of our job was uh, uh, working with prisoners, taking prisoner when we could, interrogating them. And of course, uh, this young man had to take a, g a good active part in that. You know, with such questions as what uh, what division are you in uh, would pose this to the uh, soldiers. What kind of uh, armaments uh, do you have directly facing this sector? Uh, how about tanks? We hear uh, we hear tank movement at night. We know there are tanks there. How many do you have? Well. Some Germans would talk and some wouldn't. 
and you had to ascertain them from those who would talk whether they were telling you the truth. And uh, but I recall one incident uh, very well. This is in north northern France again. It was a <clears throat> we had a, an officer, a, Ger a German officer. He was uh, rather smartly dressed. His clothing was in good shape, and uh, but he was arrogant as the Dickens. And uh, he told us in no uncertain terms that uh, we would never beat Germany. That this was, you may advance a bit, but uh, you'll have to go through the Siegfried line and there's no way you can get through it. Um, my interpreter, the, the uh, young man, uh, took exception to this fellow's uh, demeanor, and he uh, looked him up and down. And he noticed a ring on his finger. He said, uh, "Give me that ring." The uh, officer said, "No, he would not." Uh, Again, the command was repeated, give me that ring. And he said he would not, it was a germ, it was a heirloom from the family. It was his and he was going to keep it. He had that right. Uh, now I was uh, in charge of the squad at that time and I wasn't gonna let anything happen that uh, shouldn't happen, but I could see that uh, uh, this young man of, uh, was demanding the ring, that uh, he was extremely angry and uh, he made a move to take his bayonet out. And uh, he said, now give me the ring. But the officer took it off and threw it in the ground. And uh, it was repeated, give me the ring. You know, stoop over and get it. Which he did. And he handed it to uh, the interpreter. Which, and he took it and threw it as far as he could throw it. Just, he didn't want the ring. He just wanted to put this soldier, this officer who was so arrogant, uh, in his place. And uh, those things happen. The same, uh, not far away from here, and I, uh, within a couple of days of that event, uh, we were in another battle, this time with SS troops. Perhaps you've heard of the expression, the SS troops were the elite of the German army. They were, uh, uh, their, their uh, feeling for Hitler, uh, you know, he was almost a god for them. And, uh, but we had uh, defeated them in this battle and uh, there were always some wounded that they, uh, have to be taken care of, both German and our own. And there was an SS trooper on the ground and our aid man was giving him transfusion or uh, uh, blood supply. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> this young man I was telling you about, the, our interpreter, who is Jewish, as I said, leaned over to this SS trooper and says, that's Jewish blood you're getting. The uh, SS trooper said, Nick's Hobbin, Nick Hobbin. He tried to pull this out of his arm. Fortunately, the aid man and another fellow were there to stop him. But uh, those are the kind of things that happen. Of course, <clears throat> there are moments when things are a little lighter we uh, 
in that same area in France. Mickey Rooney, the actor and comedian, came in and gave him. Uh, we were back off the line for a day or two, and he and gave a program. He was quite, quite humorous, funny. Uh, and then, for some reason, we were, uh, my squad was eating. We had some, some of the canned rations. And Rooney pulled over. He was, had a Jeep that somebody, he had a driver, of course. But he saw us eating, he pulled over, and he said, I'm hungry. And uh, so he ate with our squad. And uh, he, of course, was on stage most of the time. He was, uh, he was quite a jokester. And uh, after eating, he moved on. And uh, but it was a lighter moment that you are, Did you enjoy. Did it help? Do you think with the morale? Did it help? Mm -hmm. or, or uh, not? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think it did. Uh, there were others, of course, who uh, entertained, but uh, it was a diversion, and uh, you appreciated any diversion. Um, on the other hand, there were some visitors that we, uh, and this seems strange, but the uh, Red Cross girls, there were uh, uh, active, and uh, they would uh, come to your unit and uh, banter with you a little bit. And of course, this was out of artillery range. I never cared to see them come because they always brought donuts. And if you got donuts, you know you were going right back up on the line. So I much preferred not to see them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but uh, they, they were, I think, uh, much better help and aid to uh, what we called rear echelon troops, troops who were and uh, in the back. <clears throat> um, as we moved up uh, closer to Germany, we approached this area that is known as, uh, well, uh, the Ardennes Forest and the Vosges area. The Ardennes Forest is a a uh, beautiful stretch of uh, huge trees. And uh, we ran into also the wine country uh, very close to it. Um, we were in a, this is another, another battle, and it was a very, right to, uh, right within the uh, wine area of uh, France. And uh, there were several little cities, little uh, villages that uh, were important in the wine industry. But I recall uh, one of them, and we again were, uh, had uh, been in a battle for this little town, and there was, uh, Still some fighting going on, but the fighting at that point was between tanks. It was a tank battle. And uh, <clears throat> we were in a house and uh, kind of trying to protect ourselves from any stray artillery shells. Uh, and there was a woman in there in the house. She was, we found out, very close to 90 years of age. I think she was 88. And uh, she could speak uh, French and uh, German both, as, as most people in the wine country could. She uh, said that uh, this was the third war that she had seen from this house. She'd lived in this house all of her life. 
the Franco-Prussian War of 1872, World War I, 1914 to 18. And here she was in the 1940s witnessing the Third War. And she had escaped injury on all of them. They must have felt a special need to protect her. Yes. Well, she, uh, uh, we had a young man in our, our squad who was, uh, had movie star qualities. He was a good looking young fellow. And uh, he had been in a rifle company uh, originally and had done some rather heroic things. And uh, was, uh, we needed, uh, he could also speak French and he was transferred to our intelligence unit. So uh, this old woman took a shine to him and she had quite a sense of humor. And she said, um, she offered to marry him. <laughs> if, he, if he would take her to the United States and they could start life all over again. <laughs> she was a very amu amusing woman with a good, a good spirit. Do you think she survived the war? I suspect she did. Mm -hmm. Because it very quickly moved on from there. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure she had probably relatives somewhere. Um, we, uh, we were in the wine country and we were rather certain that we were going to have a uh, big battle for a town called Celestat. And it's right in the middle of the wine, wine country. And uh, the question, question was, what kind of armaments were down in that town? And uh, how are we going to find out? What they are. We could do uh, flyovers and so on, but we knew that this was a big rail center and that uh, supplies for all the German troops in a broad area and there were brought into town by train. We knew that from, aerial, from aerial observation. So uh, my squad got the, I, sh I say, honor, uh, it was more of a, a, a real challenge to go to infiltrate the line and determine what was going on in Celestat. Uh, <clears throat> Celestat was a uh, Oh, close to 15 miles from where our general line was. And uh, between where we were and Celestat, it was heavily forested, either heavily forested or uh, vineyards. And um, uh, the best chance of going un undetected was through the forest. So uh, we took a reinforced squad. We had a couple of uh, three fellows from one of the other uh, squads in the uh, headquarters company. And uh, then uh, a sergeant from the uh, Pioneer section so uh, the challenge was to get through the mountains, to get to a point where we could observe what was going on in town. And uh, we started one night and 